Welcome back. This is our fourth class, our fourth lecture, fourth unit. And today's class went fairly smooth. I wanted to keep the time down, but not so easy to do. I want to go over a few points that we've uh, covered in today's class to help you get a heads up on things. We covered tables in the class, and tables are really a great topic for uh, APA because they're covered really in detail. And just talking to students about tables are really hard, it's abstract, and the examples in AP are really wonderful, really good examples, really well done. So we did tables, and the main point was get as much information into a table as you can, compressing it all down, not an easy thing to do. Especially the idea of basically there's one table, at least somewhere, that has kind of your whole research model included in it. So get that all in there. A single table should show your whole research design. That's kind of my main emphasis in this part of the class. And I think the students saw that through the APA examples. The next thing I went on to cover was a DIA. DIA is a wonderful open source program that really makes it easy to make your graphs and charts. Of course, Microsoft does have a program like this. But you know, when students have they graduate, they may not have access to those kinds of expensive programs and you don't really want to lock them into that so I'm emphasizing this ability to have some open source access tools that really work and I think that the key point for DIA is it is a single tool that does a single thing very well and that is flow charts, diagrams, models um, you know students, teachers, everyone just uses Word to make their graphics to make their models and it's a terrible situation where you end up having to fix it later and jigger around with it and fool around with it and DIA just works and you saw in today's class we went over that really well go over a few students let me see them and then ask a student to move a box move a line and I just want to see how they connected and then move them apart another student line them up step by step we go through the whole class everyone watching a little bit involved and they really learn on that way. It's really a great way to get them going without giving them a whole lot of pressure. So the big point on DIA is do this up front and you save time later, which is not easy to understand when you don't have people showing you that. So it's a real good point of this class. Here's some tools, do them, learn them now. You'll save time later when your thesis is giving you a lot of time pressure. Okay, let's move on to a couple of the points that came up today that held the class up. We had a relaxed pace, a slow pace. We were kind of taking it easy. I didn't want to overload. Uh, but then we got stalled a little bit by some holdups. One of the holdups was, believe it or not, just attaching the VGA cable over to the PCs. For some reason, I still haven't figured out, uh, a regular VGA cable going into this TV right here uh, just doesn't work for some reason. It, it has an attachment, it goes in, I attach it to the computer, no signal comes out. No idea why. Uh, I attach it to my computer, which is a Linux machine, it works. Uh, the computers are sending the signal out, it's not working. Last week, what did we do? We pulled the cable out, we switched the head around so that they got the other end, plugged it in, suddenly it worked. <laughs> what was that all about? The cable doesn't do anything. It's a dumb cable, just a silly cable that hooks into a smart TV and a smart computer. Uh, what's happening? I don't know. It seems like attach it to the computer first, attach it to the TV second. I've never experienced anything like that before. And it didn't happen in our first class. That was smooth. It hasn't happened to me in other locations where I attach it to an overhead projector. There's something about this TV. What does this bring up to me? This brings up the point that when you're using the technology in the classroom, stuff just happens and it goes wrong and there's not a lot you can do about it and sometimes it doesn't make any sense at all. You try to work, work out some SOP, uh, some standard operating procedure to get through the class and to have things set up, but there's always these little problems. Today I found it was this issue and then we had a second issue, which was a person's Mac. Uh, we have a Mac. Obviously, a Mac's not going to have a VGA output. It doesn't have a HDMI. It has a display port. So last week, I ordered a display port adapter to VGA Online. I got it. It came. I handed it to the student today, and she had she didn't even know where to plug it into. Uh, Sarah, right? She didn't know where to plug it in. 
this is what to expect. You're having a class that's up at a higher technology level, but many of your students are not going to be familiar with the tech. There's two ways to approach this. One way is to get afraid of that and say, hey, my students don't need what, know what's going on. How can I you know, get support? How can I get this to work? The other way to look at it is by having this happen, yes, it slows down the class, it delays things. A lot of other students kind of get involved, but you raise the awareness of the tech a little bit, and I think that in the end is a good thing. Now Sarah knows where her display port is, she knows how it functions. She still doesn't have the multiple desktop down yet, but she's kind of learning it a little bit. That's got to be a better outcome than she graduates, goes somewhere in an office and has no idea what to use. Why not have the skill to use this machine she has, this Mac, to its full potential to show off or do something well rather than be a hindrance like that? So these tech issues are, you know, two-sided. I tend to want to be a little bit more relaxed and say, hey, let's let the students try to solve it. We all work together. Also in the class, we're working on DIA. I had, you know, the things on the screen, the boxes and the arrows on the screen, and I asked someone, hey, I want you to move it this way and that way. Other students jumping in, use this menu, use that menu, and then I move on, do some cold calling, just keep going, and eventually everybody gets it, and I think that's really great. I'm not putting anybody on the spot but rather going around. The good thing is my class is big enough to do that. If I only had five students, that gets really tiresome because basically everybody's on the spot all the time. Also, if the class was bigger, like 50 students, it'd be really hard because you're just going to get 20%, 10% that aren't paying any attention. Here the class is nice in between. Everyone stays focused. I can keep people focused and they can help each other. So. That kind of sums it up for today's class. We had some computer issues, PC to television, and the Mac was a kind of a special case. One more thing I just covered today that I experienced in the class that might be helpful to you is it's my philosophy not to use teaching assistants to be dependent on them to set things up. You know, students are learning themselves. To put them in charge of a lab like this, the cameras and everything, it's just never going to really work right. So I get the SOP down. However, as you saw or can see in this video, stuff happens all the time. Today in the main setup stuff happened too. One of our ceiling cameras not coming through. I, I just slipped my mind. I didn't know why it's not coming through. I wanted one camera to face one part of the room one camera from the top to face another part of the room and I wanted one camera on the TV screen here. The reason is the student's output is in HD. The video system we have here is SD. So if I send the student's video into the main computer and then out, the quality is not going to be very clear. So I have the, the students directly connect with my cool long wire VGA right into the TV. Really awesome. Very easy, very simple, straightforward. But for some reason, I couldn't get the video camera to focus on the screen because the video camera wasn't coming through the system. It's a little bit complicated, but that's my point. There's always a couple things that even though it's in my head, I know how to do it. It just somehow slips out and I just don't, that one thing wasn't working. And so one of our students who's helping with the class, kind of not an official TA, but unofficial helping, and she's learning about it, her and a few other students learning how to use it. I said, hey, can you help me figure that one out? And we took a break. She went and looked at it, and she reminded me. She said, hey, your video inputs are set wrong. Remember that? And I thought, oh, yeah, right. And then I worked with her, and we got the video inputs right. It's always good to have a little bit of input, a second brain on things, but not dependent on managing it. It would be really overload to be asking students to do it all, and the quality, the setup would not be very consistent. However, it's really awesome to have some student helpers who are learning you're kind of mentoring them how to use this stuff, and then they can remind you, hey, remember that one. It seems to me that in my brain for doing these things, I can keep 50 variables, but in class, when it happens, there's always 52 variables. So there's always overload, one more thing that goes wrong. Okay, so uh, we're going to have vacation for a week, so I'm going to let the students go. They're going to install Zotero. Big job ahead. Zotero is really useful, super useful, a little bit complicated. Uh, but I need to push the students to get it installed and get moving on that. So we'll cover that in the next lecture.